Good evening. Welcome you to the Bateman Horn Center Monthly Education Meeting for November 2018. And a welcome to all those who are with us in uh, the building, as well as our many followers being broadcast live streaming throughout the country and internationally. My name is Rob Enns. I'm the Executive Director of the Bateman Horn Center. And tonight we have a program that's going to discuss our journey as an organization for over the past 15 years. And you're going to hear about how we got to where we are and some of the things that we have going for the future. And you're going to meet some of the interesting players who are going to be part of what we consider to be some dynamic opportunities awaiting us. So first, and without further wait, I'm going to introduce someone to you that is not a stranger, Dr. Lucinda Bateman will take us on. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. I am so excited to be here. Uh, this is a really great night um, because we're going to review a little bit about the history of Bateman Horn Center and where we're going and what we want to become. And I have some great news for you as we, as we discuss this. So this is actually an old photograph because we're in a state of constant change, but Bateman Horn Center has 18 employees and, in a, and, and staff in a beautiful 6,000 square foot center, soon to be 86, uh, uh, 8,600 square feet. So we have really built a bricks and mortar and excellent place on, on the road to becoming a center of excellence. But I wanna tell you a little history because I think sometimes <clears throat> it seems like there's just a magical huge organization that uh, has, uh, who knows how it gets there. So I want you to know how it got there. I wanna give you a little history of the nonprofit organization. And this organization started as the nonprofit, the Organization for Fatigue and Fibromyalgia Education and Research called OFFER. That was established as a 501c3 nonprofit in 2001 with a generous non-deductible, just a hey, here's some cash donation from the Marion D. and Maxine Hanks Foundation in support of um, the idea that people with fibromyalgia and MECFS should have better care and have, should have advancing research. So we put together a board, a volunteer board of invested advocates and patients who were all volunteers. Between 2000 and 2013, this little unpaid volunteer organization of sick and overextended people <laughs> um, hosted a monthly education letter, a lecture, often attended by up to 100 people. Um, it was a great, uh, a great tradition, and many of these were recorded and placed online. Um, Offer um, designed and hosted six continuing medical ed education conferences specifically devoted to fibromyalgia and MECFS. That included more than 800 attendees. These are all medical providers uh, in, in tr uh, who were coming to learn more about these illnesses. Uh, we strategically had CME sponsors through the Utah Medical Association, the University of Utah, Intermountain Healthcare, and the Veterans Medical Center in order to increase exposure to clinicians through advertising, even if they didn't come to the, con the continuing medical ed education events. Offer also designed and hosted seven educational conferences for the FM and MECFS patient and advocacy community, and attendance averaged 300 to 400 uh, each time we held a conference. And we held these conferences in conjunction to save costs so the, so the CME and the patient conferences were held together. And this small organization um, had a budget of usually around $30,000 for each of these events. As of late 2012, when we uh, created a, a flyer for our organization, our e-news had 800 to 1,000 monthly subscribers, and it was completely managed by volunteers. The website had 7,000 distinct, distinct visitors monthly, managed entirely by volunteers. Our YouTube site had 93 educational videos regarding FM, MECFS, and related topics that had been viewed more than 9,000 times and in more than 131 countries. Our our nonprofit offer was sustained by small patient donations and advocates and had a bank account of approximately $20,000 to $30,000 through that entire time. Then we received 
an unexpected donation of $130,000 after the death of a Salt Lake man who gave most of his estate to charities, to local charities. In January of 2013, Ted Cayley, a member of our board, made a motion to use that $130,000 donation to create a center of excellence. It seemed a daunting task for the small, underfunded, all-volunteer nonprofit organization, but it did plant a seed. During 2013, in that year that followed, we updated the bylaws. We had an attorney review our bylaws and update them. Scott Stevens became our new and very progressive board chair who had a vision of what our nonprofit could do for the MECFS and fibromyalgia community. I challenged the board to examine the direction of offer because things change in that decade. When we started the nonprofit, patients had no, no access to information and education. Now we have a huge amount of resources on the internet. There are many ways patients can learn. I challenged them to specifically address the most critical needs of our community, which are access to informed medical care and more progressive research to understand these diseases. So then we engaged some consultants. I, several consultants were consulted, I first put. <laughs> In October, we had a new board member come on our board who was a hospital administrator. He said that we should go ahead with our plan and he would help us do it. And the board voted to move forward on the plan to build a center of excellence. And then he moved to Arizona. <laughs> we, and meanwhile, in my clinic, the fatigue consultation clinic, we were just in the process of switching from paper medical records to an electronic health record, which cost around $30,000 on a very small budget in our clinic. In 2014, Remember, we're just a small group of people and no professionals, all volunteers. Um, and it's not me. This is the board. I'm a member of the board, but this was not under my direction. The board reviewed the books of my clinic and tried to understand the financial feasibility of a nonprofit running a clinic and research center. We invested $9,000 in a five-year membership to, to Foundation Search in order to identify potential grants. We hired an in-house accountant to manage the complex finances of, uh, of the nonprofit who would have to take over for me <laughs> because it was no longer my, business, my private business. And we'd begin drafting plans for Center of Excellence. We searched for new office space. We sought counsel from a nonprofit attorney, revised the bylaws, created conflict of interest docu documents relevant to the rebranding and the change of scope. We also hired a consultant to determine that financial feasibility, it cost us a little more than $2,000, to tell us, is it possible to, run a, run a, 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 to create a center of excellence based on the model that I was using in my clinic? And his final report, he's a great guy, uh, the feasibility report confirmed that the clinic ran in deficit and that the deficit would grow with each physician added. It's kind of mind boggling, but the, the, the center would go, you know, lose money, more, the more money each time we hired an additional physician. So the board proceeded with the plan to combine clinic income, research funding, and the new variable money we could get from grants and donations to create a sustainable center of excellence. We lost two wonderful members of our board of directors who resigned due to concern for f personal financial risk in taking this jump. We hired an executive director with a decade of experience running a nonprofit health clinic in an underserved area. Throughout that year, we rebranded as the Bateman Horn Center. We began, began the integration process of moving a private clinic and research center under the roof of a nonprofit. The IOM report, just for context, was released that February. I was diagnosed in breast cancer with breast cancer in May and underwent surgery and radiation treatments through September, but kept working throughout all that time. Fortunately, I was able to do that. And we encountered an immense amount of federal and state paperwork 
for the transition, relicensing, credentialing, and with every medical insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, pharmaceutical research contracts, and institutional review boards. And I forgot to finish the sentence up. Uh, we hired a new executive director, and within a few months, he was unable to continue his work because of illness. So we had, you know, launched ourselves out on the branch, and uh, then we lost the person that we had invested most of our money in. Uh, what was left of that hundred and thirty thousand dollar donation? <clears throat> in the fall, about when we thought things would never work, but we were not. We were we hadn't given up. A wonderful pe person, a major donor, invested two hundred thousand dollars in the vision of a center of excellence for ME-CFS and fibromyalgia. We were able to hire our new research liaison and biomarker discovery study inventor, Dr. Suzanne Vernon, and we contracted with an outside marketing and developmental consultant to help us in the absence of uh, an, an executive director. We were searching for a, a new a physician who could come and help because our plan rested on the idea of having someone besides just me running the clinic and research center. We were able to hire someone, but the contract was terminated, mutual agreement after a number of months. It just wasn't a good fit. We moved to a new location with more space to maintain a high level research lab and specimen storage. We hired staff from another clinic where, with a retiring MD and immediately adopted um, an advanced practice nurse, an RN, a clinical research coordinator and a, a medical assistant with experience in billing for our growth uh, projections. We were able to re, uh, enroll 150 patients in matched controls under the IRB protocol for the biomarker discovery project, and this allowed us to engage in collaborative research projects with, up, with eight NIH-funded researchers throughout the country, Canada, and even in Japan. Um, and especially an NIH R01 grant with Dr. Daria Unamats at Jackson Labs. In 2016, the first half of the year, we were able to hire our new executive director, doc, uh, doctor. Well, I wish he was a doctor. Maybe he's, he's, he, should, he should have an honorary doctorate degree, Rob Entz, who has extensive business nonprofit experience, including in, in the medical and world, who, beca who began strategic planning board of directors training. Remember, we were sort of a lay board that really didn't understand how to operate at a high level, um, and the revision of all of our legal documents. In August, an angel donor investor gave us $1 million of 2016. This allowed us to expand our infrastructure, hire a clinic operations manager. I have to say, uh, Rob Entz is a part-time uh, executive director, so he fits it in around another demanding schedule. We were able to hire two administrative specialists, someone to do communications and fundraising. Um, Stephanie, who's our uh, wonderful social media and everything person, and an educational uh, a person to do education and grant writing. Meanwhile, our search continues aggressively to get another physician. We were still not able to find someone to come and help me. I sent a letter to my patients, all of the Bateman Horn Center patients, telling them of the increasing demands on my time and our inability to find a physician and asked them to give me some slack and uh, you know, support us and do everything they could to be patient with my, lack of, my, my decreasing lack of clinical time. And as our model, we adopted the, this, uh, the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee, or the CIFSAC, Centers of Excellence work group recommendations as a model, and we're working toward that. Did I get both? Yep, January to June. In 2017, early, we hired a very experienced physician assist assistant to come help us because we couldn't find a clinician. But unfortunately, she had to leave her job within a few months uh, due to her own illness. We, des we developed a series of classes for patients and invited hundreds of patients unable to get into the clinic to come and learn about their illnesses through our class series. And we are about to launch the um, online version of those lectures to see if we can uh, create a broader outreach and help people who are unable to get in to see uh, experienced clinicians with these illnesses. 
Meanwhile, many efforts to recruit a physician continued. We contracted with a professional physician recruitment organization and spent tens of thousands of dollars between 2016 and 2018 searching for qualified physicians to come and be, as, be part of our center of excellence. In 2017, I sent another letter to my patients telling them all the good things we were accomplishing and the need to cut back on my clinic schedule even more due to teaching and research demands and also work in advocacy. We asked our patients to be willing to engage more with their primary care physicians, to assist in the education of those physicians, and to engage in healthy self-management. Um, <clears throat> basically see you know, if we could kind of let them spend more time uh, on their own and less time in clinics so that we would be able to manage. And at the end of 2017, one of the most amazing thing happens, and that happened, and that is, and thanks to our, our scientific director and uh, many efforts with, with our collaborative uh, researchers, we were awarded, Bateman Horn Center was awarded roles in two of the collaborative research center grants for MECFS. These are five, these are grants that go over a five year period. And we're the uh, clinical core for the, uh, for the collaboration with Jackson Labs and we're one of the clinical collaborator, uh, collaborator sites with the Columbia Center for Solutions for MECFS. So I cleared my schedule in 2018 because our, um, our grant, our project with uh, Jackson Labs was to enroll new onset patients in research to try to understand the early, early stages of disease, what's happening on with the immunology and the microbiome and the, what's the other one, and the metabolomics. But we had an, not only an aging, you know, a, a clinic full of people who had been there longer, but I'd been cutting back on my, on my uh, clinic time, not seeing as many patients. So basically I had to like clear my schedule, bring people into the clinic, uh, and evaluate them and, and, and invite them to be part of our enrollment in, in, in the JAK study. Needless to say, research enrollment slowed down this year, mostly because I was the narrow neck, right? Um, we were just weren't able to enroll as quickly as we had in all of our other studies because of my lack of bandwidth. And this lack of bandwidth has tested me across the clinical research advocacy and educational responsibilities. But it's been quite a ride, I have to say. Um, there's been this amazing growth, exponential growth, and uh, opportunity uh, for BHC, and we are, you know, putting on our seatbelts and we are riding the Bronco. <laughs> we uh, eliminated, we, we narrowed down to administrative positions for operational efficiency by consolidating roles, and the search for a physician continued until now. <laughs> <laughs> So I am very, very thrilled and grateful uh, to tell you and introduce to you two new amazing clinicians that are going to come to join us at Bateman Horn Center. The first is Neely Bucklew. She's board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation. Now it's called physiatry and I'm gonna read you her introduction more in more detail in a minute. And the second is Braden Yellman who is an internal medicine and board certified in rheumatology. I wanted to, before I read their bios, um, I want to just say that I just put up a sketch of the potential clinical resources for patients now at Bateman Horn Center as we move toward that model of a center of excellence. Now, th this is mainly the clinical side, but this allows me to have, this allows Bateman Horn Center to have two trained, experienced, um, highly qualified clinicians come and bring in these different dimensions that actually are very, very complementary to what we do here. We have a psychologist on staff here for mental health support and for doing our cognitive testing. And our patients engage or have access to educational research, uh, resources. And the, by far the majority of our patients, if they, uh, if they meet the protocols, are willing to engage in research, which is a rich blessing. I want to tell you today that one of our goals in the future is to bring primary care physicians in-house at Bateman Horn Center so that patients who cannot establish with a primary care physician might be able to have all of their health care integrated in one place. And so that's our next goal. Um, we're going to have to 
uh, wait a little bit and be patient, but as we move forward with our model, we're hoping to be able to do that. So let me tell you about Dr. Buckaloo, and then we'll have her come up and give and talk to us. Dr. Neely Buckaloo graduated from Dartmouth College in 1991, where she graduated uh, magna cum laude in anthropology and environmental science. She's done many things, and I'm not going to talk about all of them, but some of the most interesting things is she served as the executive director of a, a, I can't even pronounce it, but a resource network providing environmental education programs to elementary schools and protecting culturally important natural areas for Native American tribal governments across the continental U.S. She was recognized for her work and received a full scholarship as the first Native American fellow and Institute for the Study of World Pol Politics, where she completed a master's in environmental law and graduated magnum cum laude in 1996. She volunteered in Dr. Patch Adams' Washington Free Clinic, where she provided prenatal education and care for immigrant, indigent, and teen mothers, including become a certified doula in 1999. Before she went and got her medical degree and Master's of Science at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, where she graduated cum laude in 2010, she also trained as a prenatal yoga instructor, instructor, trained in naturopathic, Ayurvedic, and traditional Chinese medicine, and practiced as a naturopath. And she complete, after she completed her medical school training, she did a, a, a residence, internship and residency in physical medicine and rehab at the Mayo Clinic and then at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. She's engaged in a lot of research, particularly in the neurobiology of chronic pain. So I'd like to invite Dr. Buckaloo to come up and introduce herself and tell us why she's here. First, I want to say thank you to Dr. Bateman and Rob and Suzanne and just all of you. I mean, I'm just thrilled that I'm being trusted to be part of this establishment and patient care. Um, and I was thinking a lot about today, what the heck am I going to say tonight? <laughs> and what's important to say at this moment? And for me, the most important thing is to thank you for trusting me. Um, and I'm going to work very hard to keep that trust and earn that trust. I know myself from having needing uh, a lot of care in, in my past life uh, with some medical issues that the most important thing was finding providers that I really, from my soul, could trust, right? Because it's just the foundation of a healing relationship. So I'm very grateful uh, in my life that I have learned from uh, amazing mentors and how to, I hope, <laughs> you tell me, <laughs> uh, to develop those trusting relationships and really be present. Um, and you know, quite frankly, all that yoga that I've done since I was 12 uh, was really important for learning to be present uh, and, and be with a person as they are. and. Um, try not to get my ego too mixed up in what I'm listening to and um, hopefully helping that person to formulate some kind of relationship and a plan to move forward. So thank you. And, uh, oh, can we get the picture of my husband? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have a slide, <laughs> a singular slide. Tell us a little bit about what attracted you. Right. Well, <laughs> Lots of things. Rob was the, 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 the hook, actually. <laughs> he sent out uh, an email and said, hey, look at us and what we're doing. Are you interested? Um, and so I looked and I said, yes. And um, so when I was a naturopath, my main clientele at that time was mostly women, some men, but uh, chronic pain uh, and principally fibromyalgia. and. At that time in my career, you know, I, I really didn't know much about chronic fatigue syndrome. And this is long before, you know, anybody was really thinking about naming it. So, but I did deal with a lot of, uh, help to take care of a lot of people who had 
chronic issues, and we're very dissatisfied with the Western healthcare system and no one having time for them, wanting to deal with the complexities of what they're facing, uh, not willing to think outside the box, too. And so if there's one thing I can do, I'm way out of the box. There is no box for me. There is no spoon. There is no box. There's never been a box. So um, I was very impressed by Dr. Bateman and Suzanne and everyone here. Uh, what they're trying to accomplish. I mean, it's just really wonderful, and it's uh, especially in the I think in the current state of healthcare. You know, really trying to do the right thing, uh, be excellent, and and that's really important to me. Like that's wherever I've been, whatever I do. What's important to me philosophically is be excellent in what you do. Be excellent for the people that you're serving. Um, you had mentioned in <laughs> my long bio. At one point in my life, I worked with tribal governments um, and doing sacred site protection, environmental health issues, et cetera. And uh, my background is my family is Appalachian native for Cherokee and Creek and Lenape and Chumuts. Um, and so the, the chairman or the chief of the Western Band Cherokee at the time I was working was Wilma Mankiller, who is one of my great idols. And I had learned from her directly that uh, um, and my philosophy that I adopted from her was my role is to serve. A leader is a servant. So, and I see that in you, and I see that in the Bateman Horn Center. So, I'm excited to be part of that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What's your slide? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, this is my family. <laughs> That's my wonderful husband and my furry children. Who's also he's, a doctor? Yes, he's a physiatrist too, and he's trained in pediatrics um, and on top of the adult medicine. Um, and that's Bear, who sings to us every day, and that's Lucy. And uh, oh, wait, so I used to go by Dr. B, but now it's B2, which excites my husband because he's a Star Wars junkie, so it's like R2D2. Because <laughs> I'm B1. <coughs> So if we can find the slide that has their two names on it, uh, that's like the second to last slide in my presentation, I'd, that would be great if we could put that up there. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Yellman, and I want, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this little anecdote. He might want to share it also, but um, I have a brother who is 10 years older than me, who's a doctor, wonderful, wonderful family practice doctor who uh, was, has been so patient and such a good mentor for me and actually helped me find Rob Entz. Uh, <laughs> and I've had him on the hunt for people to come help us. Unrelated to us, um, Dr. Yellman sought some counsel from my brother about his medical career. And um, that my brother listened and listened and then he said, I have the perfect place for you. <laughs> so uh, that's how we came in contact, and um, we're, we've been uh, moving forward ever since. So Braden Yellman is from, he's in Cottonwood Heights, Utah now. He's a board-certified physician in internal medicine and rheumatology. He has recently been on staff with Intermountain Healthcare. He completed his undergraduate work in biology at Washington University in St. Louis, medical school at University of Texas at Houston. Then he did a residency in Denver, Colorado, uh, in Example of St. Joseph in Denver, Colorado, and a fellowship that would be an internal medicine residency, and then a fellowship in rheumatology at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. He is experienced in diagnosing, managing complex health condition, uh, conditions and issues in the outpatient setting, as well as consulting with providers throughout the Intermountain Healthcare Network. He had developed a patient triage refer referral system to help meet the demand of the many people that needed to see uh, rheumatologists in that system, paying attention to those who are most particularly ill and in need and to the underserved population suffering from prolonged waiting periods. Does that sound familiar? Um, he is a teacher and he's developed curriculum to teach primary care providers and other providers in recognizing, recognizing diagnosing, and manage, managing rheumatologic diseases. And he's presented locally and nationally on many related topics uh, in many research projects during his fellowship and medical school years. He's conversant in Spanish, 
but he's been a tireless educator, volunteer, and leader in causes for his community and profession. And he's recognized for his volunteer work as well. And I want to tell you that I think I'm a pretty quick study, um, but it took me about 20 minutes with Dr. Yeoman to be sure I wanted to hire him and come to our <laughs> clinic. So come on up, Dr. Yeoman, and tell us more about yourself and why you're interested. <clears throat> Well, thank you for those really kind words. I'm so honored to be here. Um, and it took me 10 minutes to realize <laughs> how interested I was in joining BHC. Um, it's, it's evident in everybody that you meet here just how passionate and dedicated everyone is um, to the work that they do and to the patients that they serve. And I can't think of any other reason that I went into medicine and did all of the training that I did other than to serve that goal, to help people that have nowhere else to turn and to really make an enormous impact in their lives. And uh, I was finding that in my traditional um, internal medicine and rheumatology work that it seemed like healthcare was moving away from those um, focuses, uh, that demands were more about numbers and um, churning people through a system. And that's just not how I wanted to practice. It's the reason I sought counsel in the first place to say, isn't there another way? Isn't, this isn't, didn't feel like what I trained to do. Um, and I couldn't find a better place where I think I can devote all of my talents and my energy and my time and devotion to patients uh, than here at Bateman Horn. Um, with training in rheumatology and in internal medicine, I've spent a lot of time obviously getting to know many complicated and chronic diseases and how they all interact among multiple organ systems. So that's always been a uh, particular academic interest of mine. And looking at chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, I couldn't understand a better condition where I would bring all of that knowledge and then apply it to those patients. Um, having MECFS doesn't mean you can't have additional things going on as well. And managing a chronic disease does not always mean, here's a pill that cures everything. It's about working through a process with somebody throughout their life to improve their life and their quality of life, as well as trying to find a cure. Um, I think my knowledge in rheumatology um, will come in particularly handy here. Uh, I've used a lot of immunosuppression medicines in the past, and we're starting to look at those as possible therapeutic targets in MECFS. Um, and in, in general, when we talk about fatigue, there are many autoimmune conditions that I have taken care of in the past um, that can overlap or uh, mimic MECFS. And so I think I'll be well positioned to help uh, discern between those different things and to manage um, additional complications in addition to MECFS. Um, uh, other than that, I'm just really excited uh, to join the group here and to, to try to um, bring something to the excellent people who are already doing an incredible job here. Do you want to say anything about the Stanford Symposium? The Stanford Symposium, I watched uh, from my computer at home uh, a few weeks ago. Um, it's a, a research symposium uh, about uh, some of the uh, new advances in the understanding of the biology behind MECFS and in the immunology behind MECFS. Um, and without getting into specific uh, details in the biochemistry, I thought uh, it was incredibly fascinating how they're starting to put a picture together that involves how the CNS, the central nervous system, functions, how the mitochondria, the cells, uh, energy drivers are functioning, and how those all interact uh, to create the entire complicated syndrome and really variable syndrome among different patients that we know as MECFS today. Um, there were uh, quite a few presentations that caught my interest as far as potential future therapeutic, therapeutic mechanisms um, for improving quality of life or even looking at ways to uh, reverse some of the changes that we see in this disease. So um, I'm incredibly encouraged and excited to be joining such a dynamic field and to be able to have uh, a small part in hopefully playing uh, a major impact on this disease as well. So, thank you so much. Thank you. 
I want to say just a few things about bringing on these two clinicians. Um, I am looking forward to working with two very bright, um, well-trained physicians who will assist us in our differential diagnosis and in trying to understand subsets of this illness by digging in and um, bringing their clinical acumen. Um, they both have an interest to some degree in research and have engaged in clinical research, which is going to bring a special, uh, really an extra benefit to us because of our strong commitment and our extensive engagement in clinical research. Most of all, I think these two clinicians are going to open new treatment pathways to our existing patients and to new patients. Um, ways we can uh, use many more methods, uh, some kinds of drug therapy and some kinds of behavioral and other kinds of manual methods to improve the treatment. Uh, you know, I should say, you know, add to everything we've been able to do about treatment and expand that for all of our patients. So I'm really looking forward to that. So thank you very much for listening. I want to remind you that Bateman Horn Center is a nonprofit clinic. That's part of what I wanted to tell you. Uh, we depend uh, on not only income from the clinic and from our research collaborations, but uh, we are able to run this clinic when there are no others like it and create a center of excellence if we can sustain the additional funding that comes from grants, but also from donations. So we just want to let you know that we will grow as fast as we have the money to grow and expand our services as we are able to financially. And thank you very much for listening. Are we taking any questions? We're waiting a minute to see if we have some questions that we can access through uh, our Facebook feed. So, how will you share their new learnings and treatments to your existing or older patients that live in other states? So the question is, how will we share these new treatments with our existing patients and patients in other states? Um, our existing patients, you know, we're creating a multidisciplinary clinic. so. Any one of our patients can call and sign, you know, come in to see any of our clinicians. So I would encourage our existing patients to explore um, what our two clinicians have to offer, um, if it's appropriate, and come in and pick their brain and, and you know, think, talk through and have another uh, clinician with a new view, kind of a, a fresh view, uh, look at their situation and see if there's any new things that we ought to be doing. Um, as, as much as we can use them, we're going to use them to build our online resources, educational resources, and we'll continue to um, do events like this, right, where we have lectures and we'll bring them in to share uh, their insights and expertise and what they're learning in the clinic so that uh, people outside the clinic can learn from that and have access. <clears throat> Um, what other conditions can overlap with ME-CFS? I'm interested to know what he was speaking about when he said that. <coughs> very thick. There's been a lot of comments grateful for all the, for the new doctors and we're, a couple birthday wishes for you as well, but yeah, that's the <laughs> <laughs> question of what conditions can overlap. So um, I think talking about overlapping conditions and subsets is beyond the scope of this meeting, but I think we all know uh, from what were, you know, from patient blogs and from interest in small fiber polyneuropathy and interest in, uh, in uh, mast cell activation syndrome and interest in, you know, what, is, what are the autoantibodies against muscarinic and adrenergic receptors and what do they mean? Um, so, and, you know, many of our patients, uh, if they don't get a diagnosis of fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia or MECFS, might get a diagnosis by an understanding clinician of atypical MS or, you know, an ill-defined rheumatologic disease because physicians recognize that the patients are sick, but they don't niche perfectly into the known diagnostic criteria for another illness. But what has happened as we've gotten regimented is that diagnostic 
you know, that, 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 that bell curve of how people present with an illness has become very narrow so that only the major presenting symptoms are, are, are so that they're required to make a diagnosis, which creates a lot more marginalization. So, and he's kind of talking about these different pots of people, of, that, of the research, and we don't know where it will lead us, but um, we may learn, for example, from the field of rheumatology and how they use agents that alter immunity uh, and be able to, as the science unfolds, use those principles and some of those drugs to do clinical trials to see if it will be effective in people with our disorders. So that's an example of how it might, um, how it might pan out. I was say you mean, might need to come up here. <clears throat> Um, I thought it might be helpful to explain what a physiatrist is. That's a great idea. Because <laughs> a lot of people don't even know what that is. I remember the first time somebody did a presentation and said, I'm a physiatrist. I, you know, under the table Googling, you know, like, <laughs> what is that? So um, we go, so physiatrists, we're called physiatrists, physiatrists. Uh, the bigger label for us is physical medicine and rehabilitation. Um, our practice, or our specialty, came out of first after World War II, working with soldiers with uh, multi-trauma and amputation, and then, didn't, then we just kept growing, working with uh, people with uh, spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, and then it kept expanding, working with people with neurologic conditions, rheum rheumatologic conditions. Um, and now, uh, two big areas that we're involved in is pain management. Um, and uh, sports medicine is a big one. And we run inpatient units, rehabilitation units, where we take care of people who have had prolonged hospitalizations, uh, recovering from stroke, neurologic uh, diseases. Uh, sometimes we uh, bring people with multiple um, uh, diseases into a hospital to work with them, like MS or Parkinson's. Uh, so we, we're kind of the, I call us the MacGyvers of medicine, we're the generalist of the specialist or the specialist of the generalist, you know, we do a lot of things, but what we really do, uh, and why I kind of fit here, is we really look at, are you thriving? And, you know, if you're not, why not? And, and ultimately, it doesn't really even matter what it is that the, the diagnosis is, you know, the silo. We really look at, okay, who are you? And how are we going to make you thrive and feel better? And so we kind of look at things a little differently. We look at things like um, your sleep, right? Your bowels, your bladder, your skin, your pain management, all these things. We kind of look at it that way. And how do we work on those areas of your life so that you can feel like a whole human being? And that's what really physiatry is all about. And it really uh, dovetails really well with my previous background as a naturopath. So. And a massage. Learning all those massages. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm really big on, on self care and self management. So uh, everyone you know who meets me is going to learn something. You know, some little something to take care of themselves and hopefully make their lives a little better. Dr. Bichu, does that mean both pharmacologic and non pharmacologic um, approaches? Yeah, the only thing we don't do are major surgeries. <laughs> uh, you know, the pain uh, uh, specialist will do a lot of procedural stuff. I do some procedural stuff. Uh, but it's pretty much anything except for major surgery. And, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other pressing questions online? Are we good? We, we do have a lot of questions online. Um, one of them, what neurological and immunological, did you ask this one already, um, roles does PFS ME play in automatic nervous system disorders, such as POTS, um, orthostatic hypotension, and multiple system failure, and what is in the future for research? So that was kind of a long, complicated question about <clears throat> pathophysiology, and I'm going to say it again, it's beyond the scope of what we're doing here tonight. We will try to do those things. But what I want to emphasize uh, is the skills that this, this set of clinicians bring. When I was in medical school at Johns Hopkins, one of the most venerable physicians there was a woman named Mary Betty Stevens, who was the head of rheumatology. And she taught a class called multi-system illness, which was well beyond its time. 
which helped people recognize the types of illnesses that can affect multiple organ systems in your body. And it was like the early part of learning about lupus and autoimmune diseases. And I've never forgotten that lecture, and I think it's impacted uh, the way I practice and why I've been able to recognize and treat these illnesses, you know, because I'm, I'm a generalist and I'm not in a specialty box. So um, that's a very special thing, and as you heard from Dr. Buckaloo, uh, physiatrists train a little bit along the same lines. You know, they're not a specialist in, in just one organ system. They're a specialist in looking at how the patient is functioning and how their whole body is functioning and how to bring the science and the experience to helping people function and feel better through all the different uh, resources she has as a physician and with those other uh, trainings. So, um, Stephanie, I'll do another question, but let's, uh, let's not go for the science questions if possible. Here's a simple one. <laughs> how about some just some best exercises with uh, some recommendations for exercises with CFS? It's a, little, it's a little bit off topic. So the question is, what kind of exercises can you do with MECFS? And I'll just say, you should watch our video, but <laughs> our class. It uh, doesn't go into much extent because it's actually a big topic. Even in a one-hour video, we know we, where we talk about conditioning and, and pacing and activity intolerance, it's hard to go into much detail. But essentially, with these illnesses, you first have to respect the illness and learn how to pace your activity so that the illness is not unnecessarily flaring and causing uh, more, more damage and more symptoms. However, it is critical to do the, everything possible to maintain your muscle tone, your range of motion, your balance, and your ability to get around. So any kind of exercise program will have to fall within those boundaries. If people have orthostatic intolerance, we recommend pool therapy or uh, you know, uh, conditioning exercises that are not uh, in water but maybe lying down or seated so that they, their orthostatic intolerance is not aggravated. If pain is the primary symptom, then we have to you know, keep the conditioning within the bounds of, of dramatic pain escalation. And if people have very, very low energy reserves, then ex you know, efforts to get stronger or do things really need to be in very, very small bites that don't exceed those energy limitations and produce post-exertional malaise. I have a question. Um, Dr. Bainton, it must be pretty exciting to be you know, at the, the founder <coughs> of this center of excellence. What is your vision for the Bainton Horn Center of Excellence? So I'll repeat the question for, from Suzanne. I'm not sure if you could hear it, but she said, um, I must be thrilled and excited, and what is my vision for the Bateman Horn Center? Yeah, I'm thrilled and excited. <laughs> so our vision, all of us, the board, the staff, um, all of us in input from patients, is to, to create, in the absence of federal funding for centers of excellence, we wanted to take the initiative <coughs> to build a model of a center of excellence that would create an environment for good clinical care, some on site, maybe we train clinicians, maybe we go out and, and, and treat and teach clinicians, but we want to create a standard of good clinical care for, for, the, for our patient base. We want to expand uh, research. We want to facilitate and move research along as quickly as possible. And we want to work. We want to use our well-defined patient base of very uh, eager and willing patients to encourage uh, the research to move more quickly and in larger numbers. Uh, my vision is, my personal vision, vision, and the vision of our organization is that these il illnesses will be mainstreamed into all medicine and of, of uh, science. And, and clinical care, that every specialist in every field will understand what these illnesses are scientifically, and that every clinician will uh, understand, and that we can become <clears throat> the place that is on the cutting edge of new treatments and clinical trials, and uh, a place where people can train clinically or scientifically uh, to learn more about how to take care of patients. We have a very lofty vision, and it's not about only about us. It's about us facilitating and changing the way things have been for patients with fibro and uh, MECFS. 
Could you explain the time frame and the process of taking on new patients? Like expanding that, is, is there a time frame that you've looked at and said, okay, we have two new clinicians and we're gonna expand a certain number of patients and then what's the process of choosing that from a, so, is, is that an appropriate question? Yeah, that's an appropriate question. So the question is, what's the time frame and the process for bringing in new patients? I hope that indirectly, as we went through, um, you can see that one person cannot possibly, mm -hmm. uh, who has a whole practice full of patients and is supervising all the research and spearheading the education and going out and doing things throughout the country cannot possibly handle a load of very many new patients. Um, our first priority right now is to complete the, our enrollment in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the study with Jackson Labs that aims to um, enroll 100 to 150 patients. Now, not all of those will be new onset disease, but we still are looking for at least 50 patients with who clearly and you know to be carefully evaluated right this is a very important study who we think meet the criteria for the first three or four years of this of MECFS. Um, now that we have two clinicians our ability to see new patients is going to dramatically improve and that's been the sense of urgency of bringing on another clinician um, a new patient uh, consult in this clinic is not trivial it's not a 30-minute <coughs> visit um, you know, most of our patients have been seen by numerous physicians, and this is going to be the time that, 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 that we um, review everything. We know everything we can about them medically, and we kind of front load all that information, and then we design a course of diagnosis and treatment that may proceed over a year or two years. So, um, and we also, um, and, and we don't take it lightly, right? We feel like it's very important to, to do, uh, do our due diligence to make sure we know what's going on with the patient medically, psychologically, and uh, what how they niche in to these uh, case definitions. And then it's a process of really trying to understand deeper after that. But um, our first priority is, to, is quality, um, because there is no way this one clinic can meet the needs of people with MECFS and fibro, even in Utah. So the yeah, numbers are great. So that's why we've changed our focus to a clinic that will um, kind of try to set the standard. We'll see as many patient, patients as we can, but our, our, one of our primary goals is to educate other physicians so that they can also take care of patients. Okay, well, I think our time is up. So thank you so much for listening, and I hope this brings you uh, some hope uh, and encouragement for what lies ahead.